Hello once again. Welcome to Plant America's Fireside Chat. I'm John Barron. I'm Chazza Jadala. Thanks for joining us on ABC News and News Radio in the week when the coronavirus death toll in the United States passed 1,000 and America overtook China as the country with the most confirmed cases. The United States also saw the biggest spike in claims for unemployment benefits in its history. The stock market, though, rallied after the Senate agreed on a $2 trillion spending package. And despite the warnings of health experts, the president says he wants America to reopen by Easter. I think there are certain people that would like it not to open so quickly. I think there are certain people that would like it to do financially poorly because they think that would be very good as far as defeating me at the polls. So, the president is making it about him rather than necessarily the infection rate on the ground, as the medical experts would like. But how are things looking at this particular moment? Yeah, let's look at those numbers. They're pretty dire. America is now suffering more than 200 deaths a day, with about 1,200 in total so far. As John said, America has now surpassed China in total cases as well, with over 80,000 cases in total and 15,000 more cases every day. But I just want to show you how serious the situation is getting. Two weeks ago, there were 41 deaths and 1,672 cases in total. A week ago, there were more than 41 deaths and more than 1,672 cases just that day. Then last week, there were 206 deaths in total and 13,800 cases in total. Today, there are more deaths and more cases again just today. So does that mean that in a week's time, America is looking at more than 1,200 deaths and 80,000 new cases a day? I would not rule that out, to be honest, for reasons I'll tell you about a little bit later. And one of the, I guess, more anecdotal but also very telling measures mm is the sheer despair and grief on the face of the medical professionals who every day this week have had the worst day of their lives. Mm. And then they go back and do it tomorrow and they do it wearing the same mask and gown at the end of the day that they started the day with as well, which obviously you are not supposed to do. Mm. And they're not just seeing COVID-19 sufferers, but they're seeing all the usual things that come through in New York City or other major metropolitan hospital in the United States. And they're terrified that they are by seeing this person who has broken their arm after having seen somebody with COVID-19, that they've just given this person COVID-19. This is a terribly distressing situation based on the fact that they are already, they're running out of the basics, the gloves, the masks, the gowns, everything. They really are. And America is watching this on their TVs at home at the moment. Some of the vision is quite stark. I'll, I'll show you an example of what I'm talking about. Uh, now, if you've got kids at home, I would suggest you either get them out of the, the room or pause. This is not graphic, but it could freak them out a little bit. This is what Americans are seeing on their TV in New York right now. Today is kind of getting worse and worse. We had to get a refrigerated truck to store the bodies of patients who are dying. Now that's a big truck. It certainly is. And it's going to get a lot worse, to be honest, because Andrew Cuomo has been talking about the shortages that you just described. Uh, he's been holding press conferences every day, uh, becoming a bit of a media star, but uh, you don't want to be a star for this. He's been talking about the things that they're short of. Like, for instance, we'll start off with beds. That's a pretty essential element when it comes to hospitals. That means the number of hospital beds, which is at 53,000 beds, 3,000 ICU beds. The anticipated need now for the height of the curve is 140,000 hospital beds and approximately 40,000 intensive care unit beds. OK, so they're going to need at their peak three times as many beds and eight times as many intensive care beds. Their peak, two weeks away. That's what the experts say. Yeah. So and, and they're literally having to empty out storage spaces in hospital. They've, they've opened up all the, the dormant wards. Mm. They've all, all of the, you know, the, the beds, physical beds they can find in the workshop. They're, they're bringing them back in whether they're fully functioning or not, you know, whether you can crank up their head, all that kind of stuff. They're doing everything they possibly can and then finding areas of the hospital which hadn't previously been areas for wards and clinical areas and so on. Uh, th this is... We're, we're going to be seeing people 
if they can get the ventilators, they'll be on ventilators in broom closets. Yeah, well, that's the next question, the ventilators. Because for those who don't know what a ventilator is, this is what helps you to breathe when you cannot breathe. So if you need a ventilator and you can't get a ventilator, you die because you can't breathe. It's as, it's as simple as that. And Cuomo reckons that New York has a bit of a problem with ventilators too. We've procured about 7,000 ventilators. We need, at a minimum, an additional 30,000 ventilators. FEMA says we're sending 400 ventilators. Really? What am I going to, what am I going to do with 400 ventilators when I need 30,000? You pick the 26,000 people who are going to die because you only sent 400 ventilators. OK, now that is what Americans are watching on TV yeah. right now. And that level of desperation from Andrew Cuomo, it's worth noting, he is doing daily briefings and he has been keeping his cool. Mm. Uh, he is speaking multiple times a day to President Trump and is clearly trying to put politics aside, trying to say, Mr President, this is what we need of you. He's been very careful mm. not to criticise President Trump Critical there of FEMA's response, which is mm. half a step removed from criticising mm. President Trump. But clearly the, uh, the strain is getting to him and the passion is, uh, yeah. is quite evident. And to be fair to FEMA, they apparently only have 20,000 in their stockpile for the whole country. And right. it's not just New York. Yeah. There's a lot of places that need ventilators. And 20,000 wouldn't cover New York alone. Remember two weeks they've got, and they can't just, uh, they just can't just make them appear out of nowhere because it takes months to make these, these things. These are, these are very uh, precise bits of equipment. The FDA need to approve it. If, you're, if, like if, some, if some dude in a, in a garage wants to make a, a ventilator, they can't yeah. just give it to a patient because it will kill them. Well, exactly. So, and when, when you're talking about life support, if mm. the machine goes wrong, the person dies. Absolutely. So, so great that uh, you've got vacuum cleaner manufacturers saying, hey, we've designed one, we can, we can start producing you know, a million a month, but of, of course, you, you, that's going to take many months to make sure that they're not worse than the, the underlying condition. Now, there's all kinds of people trying to help out. Uh, yeah, Bill Gates has been trying to help out. Elon Musk bought 1,200 uh, ventilators from overseas and has donated them, but the, the hole is so much bigger than they can fill at the moment. Yeah. And, I, and, and so now I, we mentioned on Wednesday is also the mask situation, which seems so, so trivial. It's a, just a mask, but mm. if you don't have the right mask, then you get sick. And yeah. we're finding this all around the world, doctors getting sick. And with the virus in over 150 countries already, there's a question of morality around mm. saying, here's big American dollars, we're going to pay whatever it costs to get ventilators out of, say, China mm. or South Korea now. So, the, you know, clearly the lack of a stockpile is an issue and what do you do to prepare for a once-in-a-century event such as this pandemic? I'm going to talk to Andy Slavitt, who ran Medicare and Medicaid for Barack Obama a little later in the program and raised some of these sort of inventory issues. How do you prepare for this? How do you anticipate this? And how do you move stock around the United States? Well, Trump had something to say about the mask situation uh, the other day as well. Through FEMA, the federal government is distributing more than 8 million N95 respirators, 14 million surgical masks, and many, many millions more under order. Yeah, so that's good, but the problem is... Under like, order. And also, like we said on Wednesday, they need billions of masks. Yeah. That 8 million masks, that's going to that's gonna be used up by one hospital in a couple of months. So they need way more than that. And it, they just can't make it appear from nowhere. The reason this is so important, like I said, the doctors are getting sick. In Spain, 14% of their cases are doctors. Yeah. In New Orleans, it's even worse, actually. In New Orleans, over half of the emergency medical service personnel are currently under quarantine. Half. And so that, of course restricts what you can do what you can do to try and help other people as well when the, when the medical staff is sick. Uh, so the, 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 you're asking about how you can plan for these kinds of things. I just make one more point mm. that I'm not blaming any particular person here, but it's a fact that Trump was saying that you can't predict these kinds of things. That's not true. There's been report after report after report. Every year there's a report about pandemic preparation and saying that America is not ready. There was one in October 2019, directly before this happened. They, they ran the Health and, the Health and Human Services uh, uh, Cabinet, uh, the Secretary, ran a, a trial and, and it's called Crimson Contagion. And they found that the current supply chain cannot meet the demands imposed by nations during a global influenza pandemic. And America also lacks domestic manufacturing capacity for the production of sufficient quantities of personal protective equipment. 
and it was ignored. Mm. Yeah. yeah. Well, there will be some lessons learned, no <laughs> doubt. Uh, meanwhile, though, uh, to the relief of many, uh, on Capitol Hill, we've seen an outbreak of bipartisanship. Mm. A lot of money has been spent all of a sudden. The United States Senate unanimously approved a $2 trillion emergency package this week to try and cushion the impact of the coronavirus. Here are some of the key features of the bipartisan bill, which is the most expensive bill in history. Many American adults will soon receive a cheque for $1,200. They'll be going out to an estimated 150 million households. People who are unemployed will receive $600 a week on top of the state jobless benefits for a period of up to four months. $100 billion is being pumped into the hospital industry. $500 billion worth of loans will be made available to industries like airlines, cruise companies and others. $10.5 billion goes to the Defence Department. That'll pay for things like sending out 20,000 National Guard troops to be deployed to help the state response teams deal with this crisis. Then there are a suite of other tax deferrals for businesses, including retail and other incentives to try and keep workers on the payroll, standing them down rather than sacking them. There was a lot of last-minute haggling over this. Several Republican senators expressing last-minute concerns. These jobless payments are too generous. So generous people would just quit their jobs in the middle of a pandemic. Well, that prompted some vintage Bernie Sanders in response. Take a look. Oh, my word! Will the universe survive? How absurd and wrong is that? What kind of value system is that? Meanwhile, these very same folks had no problem a couple of years ago voting for a trillion dollars in tax breaks for billionaires and large profitable corporations. Not a problem. I should say, just to be fair to those Republicans, mm. that what they're saying is correct, that there actually, there actually would be a situation where for many states where people don't get paid very much, yep. the unemployment benefits would be considerably more than their wage and they're supposed to last for four months. So if you try and get the economy off its knees, there is literally no incentive for them to try to... They're not going to quit. But if, they, if they're fired, because you can't right. get unemployment benefits if you quit. Yes. But if they're fired, there's no incentive for them to try and get a job over the next four months at least because they actually earn more doing nothing. Yeah. Now, I, having said that, you need to shovel this money out fast and, and you have a depression-like situation which they've got here. So personally, I don't think that's a very good argument from the Republicans in this particular circumstance because they just need to get the money out there and get spent. Even if people don't work for four months, just get the money out there. Yeah. But... Uh, Having said that, they didn't make that up. They, that, what, what they were saying was, was not a figment of their imagination. Yeah, obviously it's a, a very complex situation where people are being told, well, you're not sacked, but you need to take up all your leave and then when your paid leave expires, we'll give you unpaid leave. So you're sitting at home, you've technically got a job, but you have actually got no income at all. Mm. And then you don't qualify for the jobless benefit at the same time. So tremendously difficult. You can get through that if this is two, three months. Yeah. If this is 18 months, it's an entirely different matter as well. Yeah, we're actually seeing all around the world, um, not just in America, in England and Denmark and Europe, that there's this new, there's this furlough system which they're developing where, where and this is, they've got the same thing in this bill here, where people are essentially paying, the government's paying small business and businesses to keep their workers on the books, even if they've got no job for them. Yep. Just so when things speed up again, the economy speeds up again, they've got a job waiting for them and the business can can kick back in the gear. Yeah, which is to everyone's which benefit if they fulfil that end of the bargain, yeah. which clearly they didn't in the global financial crisis because they knew it was going to take a lot longer. This could be over in six months if there is a, a vaccine all of a sudden or there's you know, some, some treatment that makes this less potentially deadly to, uh, to, to people. The, uh, the Senate bill goes to the House... Uh, it's assumed that it's going to go through the House pretty quickly on Friday US time, so in the next few hours or so. Then it's going to go to the President's desk. He says he will sign this thing into law immediately. It's also worth noting, Chaz, with the, that extraordinary figure of 3.3 million new claims mm. of, for, for the jobless benefit. Can I show that on a graph? Because it's amazing. Yeah, Just absolutely. have a look at this. Have a look. This, this, this is what 3.3 million initial unemployment claims looks like on a graph. It's more than five times the previous record in 1982. By the way, put that number in context. Mm. The worst of the last recession, this big recession, had America losing in its worst quarter 
2.3 million jobs in the worst quarter. Yeah. That is that is 12 weeks. In one week, they beat that by a million unemployed people. Yeah. So, uh, and, and clearly, the shutdown has had a lot to do with that because it has made a, this a... Uh, not just an, a massive economic shock with maybe 25% knocked off GDP in the next quarter is the latest numbers going around from Goldman Sachs, but that this is all happening at once yes. uh, and that we've got entire sort of state economies effectively grinding to a halt is pretty remarkable. The other thing that's contributing to it as well, which uh, some of those that are trying to sort of say, don't, don't get too carried away by this, uh, is that uh, there are people who were in the so-called gig economy who are also uh, finding themselves entitled to sign up as mm. well. So, so there's, in a way, this is as much a good news story as a bad news story, which probably explains why the Dow went up 1,300 points uh, off the back of this or maybe despite this and with the stimulus bill going through the House. Oh, as a little aside, I know we're not supposed to care about deficits anymore, but, and we certainly don't have to care about deficits right at this moment when you're going to a depression, but just something to remember, the CBO projected a $1.07 trillion deficit this year before any of this. Yeah. So you add $2.2 trillion on top of that, and you're dealing with like pushing a $3.5 trillion deficit this year. This is when those tax cuts from two years ago, when the bill is starting to come due, yeah. because that deficit is just out of control. Ironically, even though there's been a lot of attention to the fact that, you know, Trump's economy that was going so great has suddenly gone so bad, economists were already talking about there being maybe a 30% plus chance of recession pre-coronavirus this year anyhow, mm. and that Trump's economy was looking a little bit wobbly because of that level of debt. Mm. Uh, this is maybe a get-out-of-jail-free card for Donald Trump when it comes to his handling of the economy. This is clearly not his fault. Unless it can be made his fault because of his mishandling of coronavirus. But yeah. in terms of economic management, uh, you know, and we'll look at some of his approval numbers a little later in the program, but uh, right now he is so showing a certain amount of resilience. Well, like I showed on, on Wednesday, it this literally has not affected his approval rating whatsoever. Yeah. Well, President Trump maintains that he does want to see at least some Americans back at work as early as Easter. That's just two weeks away. I have had so many people and they want to practice social distancing, and they want to practice no handshaking, no handshaking. They're not going to go walk around hugging and kissing each other in the office when they come back, even though they may feel like it. They're going to do, they're going to wash their hands more than they've ever done. They're going to do all the things you're supposed to do. But Steve, you know what? It's, it's time. They want, people want to get back to work. Now, the experts are saying you can't do two things at once. You can't send people back into offices and just have them wash their hands. Mm. Either you keep more than 80% of the people at home for more than 80% of the time, or this virus will keep going and going and going. Yeah, yeah. I, I, look, I'm a bit loath to hoe into Trump at the moment until we know what he's actually going to do, because... At the moment, he's just, he's just saying a lot. Oh, wouldn't it be nice if we can go back for, for Easter? Right. It, so you think this could just be sort of the kind of happy talk we were hearing a month ago to prop, prop up the market? You never, yeah, yeah, you never know what he's going to do. He, he, he changes his mind daily. So yeah. I, wouldn't, I wouldn't take that to the bank quite yet, especially given some of the things I'm about to tell you later on about what's coming over the next few mm -hmm. weeks in terms of this disease. Um, so that's the first thing. I don't but think but should... surely that's the point. If you have the Commander-in-Chief, the President of the United States, disconnected from the reality, trying to talk things up, maybe he thinks that he's playing a positive role for morale, but he is also affecting people's ability to prepare what is coming, and not just people in their own personal lives and in their homes and in their works, but also businesses. Because if business is hearing you're going to be reopened in two weeks, they're making very different decisions today than if they're being told... I'm sorry, the best guess is you're, you're shut down for three to six months. Look, that is true. That is true. And he does... He, he's... He's people watching him every single day with this stuff. So there is a power in that by itself. But we should remember as well, it's not up to him. He doesn't make the decisions. The state governors make the decisions. There are 17 states at the moment that have stay-at-home rulings. Yep. And Trump doesn't change them. It's, yep. the, it's the governors that but change But the decision them. that he makes or doesn't make is to actually use the Defence Production Act to get those ventilators coming, to get those masks coming. In a few months' time, yeah. And he, but he is not using them now. Why is he not using them now? because of this short-term thinking, because he's not yep. saying we're not going to put in orders that are not going to be delivered for three to six months because I'm saying it's going to be over by then. So he's sending the wrong signal to industry by not compelling them to rise to this occasion. I would agree with that. So Trump has had these daily briefings which are going up to two hours. They've become his new MAGA rallies in a way with just lots of health officials and cabinet uh, colleagues around him. 
Joe Biden is trying to sort of run this sort of reassuring shadow presidency out of his living room in Wilmington, Delaware as well. But he's been quite critical, saying that basically Trump's thinking on this at the moment is dangerous. Take a look. Look, we all want to get back to normal as quickly as possible. But we have a lot to do to make that possible. We have to do it in a smart way to meet, not meet some arbitrary or symbolic timeline. You know, and it would be a catastrophic thing to do for our people and for our economy if we sent people back to work just as we were beginning to see the impact of social distancing take hold. Now, President Trump says he is going to do it in a smart way. He's not going to open up the country all at once. He's going to do it in a staged way. He wants to identify high, medium and low-risk counties and allow the folks that are in those low-risk counties to keep working and to buffer some of the impact and all this. But he also has a theory, the president does, uh, he expressed it more sort of plainly on Twitter, where he blamed the media for wanting to keep America shut down to damage his chances of re-election. The lamestream media is the dominant force in trying to get me to keep our country closed as long as possible in the hope that it will be detrimental to my election success. The real people want to get back to work ASAP. We will be stronger than ever before. It will be interesting to see where this goes because right now Trump has, has some people whispering in his ears. He's got state governors whispering in his ears saying, we don't want this and we're not going to listen to you. Mm -hmm. He's also got Lindsey Graham, who's buddy. Even he's telling him, back off. Lindsey Graham tweeted, try running an economy with major hospitals overflowing, doctors and nurses forced to stop treating some because they can't help all, and every moment of gut-wrenching medical chaos being played out in our living rooms, on TV, on social media, and shown all around the world. There is no functioning economy unless we can control the virus. Welcome back, Lindsey Graham. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's like the other Lindsey Graham's had this guy locked in his home <laughs> for the last three years. Suddenly he's talking sense again. He's, he's right, though. That, that yes. You, you can't possibly get the economy again, whether you like it or not, right. if people are dropping dead everywhere. If they're, if they're, there's literally thousands of people dying a day, which there may well be in two yeah. weeks' time. No one's going to go back to work. Look at Australia right now. I know of a school nearby which has 1,000 people and they are supposed to be at school at the moment and yesterday they had 15 people there because mm. people are scared. Right. And it doesn't matter what you tell them. If they're scared, they're not going to go to work. The economy is not going to come back. So Trump doesn't have a choice no matter what he says. Yeah, well, we'll see because we've already had uh, some state officials in places like Texas mm. saying that we need people over the age of 70 to effectively sacrifice themselves for the state of the economy. Mm. And uh, we've got, you know, if you watch Fox News right now, you're seeing people like Dr Oz saying, yeah, I agree with the president, uh, the cure is worse than the cause. They're talking about the economic cure yeah. rather than the viral cause, which is weird for a doctor to be talking about on Fox News. What I think we need to do is remember why the lockdown is happening in the first place. Uh, Governor Whitmer put it quite well. This intervention is important to buy time so we can create surge capacity in our hospitals, so we can ramp up testing and develop therapeutic drugs that may lower hospitalization and fatality rates. Now, it's to buy time. It's to buy time yep. while you get your equipment up, while you bend the curve. They've had a week. They haven't had any time to do anything. Right. <laughs> so it's, uh, as, as John Hopkins, Director for Health Security, noted, these big social distancing measures, they take time to work. The impact of big interventions in Wuhan, China, took about three weeks to start to reverse things. And then every day after the situation got better. In America, we're about seven to 10 days into this, depending on the state. Look, Italy. They had their lockdown at the beginning of March. It's only, the deaths have only just started to level out now, three and a half weeks later. If you bail out now or in a week's time or, or half bail out, right. like he's talking about, then you can have a, a situation where you're going to have the economy, you're going to have the, the deaths continuing to rise when you bail out. Yep. And you're going to have to go back into lockdown, except for now with the hospitals overrun, Yep. which will be so much worse. And we've still yet to see what happens when you prise open those doors in Wuhan and let people out again. We, mm. we don't yet know what is going to, you know, are we going to see, like those graphs you showed us a few weeks ago about the cities that, that reduced the restrictions in 1918, 1919 and saw the Spanish flu come roaring back twice as deadly as before. 
I've got a graph about that. Have you? Yes. We talked about St. Louis. Yeah, uh, sure. So, yeah, if you look at St. Louis mm. itself, which was, by the way, the best case scenario back in 1918, they didn't know as much then. Mm. If you look at the, de the deaths from the flu in St. Louis, they brought in restrictions. They had school closures. They had public gatherings, bans. But, and then they, and it worked. It brought down the deaths. Have a look. See, there are two clear bumps there in deaths. And it just so happens that the second bigger bump occurred just after St. Louis removed their public gathering ban and school closures. Then they brought back the bans on schools and public gatherings. The deaths dropped again. It's that second bump there that America needs to avoid. Well, let's hope a hundred, <laughs> in a hundred years we've at least learned when a pandemic seems to have settled down, you don't hold a public parade to celebrate <laughs> the fact that the pandemic has ended. OK, just, just before we go, I just want to explain to you what I said before about what's coming in the next yeah. few weeks. Let me show you what's coming in the next few weeks. This is why I think nothing's going to happen. OK. okay? This is all about bending the curve, right? Mm -hmm. Let's look at the curve. These are the new COVID cases every single day. Look how rapidly that number is rising at the moment. It's not levelling off. If anything, the growth is speeding up. Now, let's look at the daily deaths. Once again, the new deaths are growing every day. I want to give you some context. Your average flu year has about 100 deaths a day on average. Another comparison Trump's been making recently, car accident deaths. They're also 100 deaths a day. So flu deaths and car deaths combined is that line there which we have blown past. There are way too many deaths right now to mess around and things could get a lot worse. Look at the current new cases every day for the most worrying states in America. Okay, New York's at the top of the list, we all know about that. But then you've got New Jersey with two and a half thousand new cases just yesterday. Then you have a bunch of seven more states, all at about 500 new cases a day and growing. Now that's where New York was a week and a half ago. Any of those eight states there are a couple of bad days away from becoming the next New York. You know when that's going to happen? Tell Around me. Easter. Hmm. That's when it's due to happen. If you get one, two or eight of those states becoming New York in the next week and a half or two weeks, you're going to get tens of thousands of deaths. They cannot afford to mess around right now when it's so delicately balanced. All right. Well, for an expert opinion, we're joined now by Andy Slavitt. He was the acting administrator of the Centres for Medicare and Medicaid Services under President Obama, and he played a central part in the rollout of the Affordable Care Act, Obamacare. Andy Slavitt, welcome to Planet America. Thank you for having me. We're seeing doctors, nurses, even state governors literally begging for medical equipment this week. Why has America found itself in this situation? Poor planet. Uh, we started late, and when you're trying to catch up to uh, something, uh, it's hard when you start late. But when you're trying to catch up something that's growing exponentially, because I think as we most of most people in the world know now, uh, we have uh, the average person infects two people or more. When you're trying to catch up to something exponentially, it's sort of like trying to swim after a motorboat. By the time you get to where the motorboat was, uh, it's it's farther away, and so. Uh, we are seeing, uh, unfortunately, an enormous crush here in uh, U.S. hospitals of, uh, of patients that we are really doing our best to scramble for and get ready. When it comes to that sort of short-term response, what should have been being done in December or January or February that wasn't done until too late? Well, I think several things. I think uh, there was no command and control structure in place. And look, many, many of these things are... are um, they're not the most relevant right now, of course, because you have to navigate from where you are, not where, where you wish you were. Uh, but I think when we uh, go and do this again, I think we'll follow some of the guidance from Bill Gates and others who suggested that you know, we, we could be more prepared by stockpiling more. Of course, you can never be prepared for uh, every possible scenario, but certainly having more medical equipment, more ventilators. Uh, you know, Right now, I'm afraid that most of the fatalities in the U.S. are not going to come from people's age or from their underlying illness. It's going to come because they won't be able to get access to a ventilator. And that's really the worst reason, uh, because people should be, people who would otherwise be leading long, long lives. I think um, we also probably are, uh, some of our politicians really underplayed this and, and maybe even continue to underplay this. And so for a long time, when people sh should have been um, uh, getting prepared and locking down and socially isolating. We have people in New Orleans and uh, in Florida and other places that were busy 
I think, being all over the place and doing exactly the wrong thing. Today, New Orleans is now officially the fastest growing hotspot in the world. Andy, no government can afford to stockpile half a million $25,000 ventilators just in case there is a once-in-a-century pandemic. How do, you, how do you prepare for what is likely to happen when you know it's going to come at the expense of, uh, of machines to treat somebody with cancer or some other condition if the pandemic never happens? I think public health experts would probably say that uh, it would have been inexp inexpensive relative to the cost to us now. But, you know, that's always the perspective in retrospect. I, you know, I think what the president could have done before and what he should do now is publicly announce that he's going to purchase 500,000 ventilators, uh, 2 billion N95 masks, and for most people now know those are the, the masks that help keep our frontline healthcare workers safe. Uh, and, and likewise, a sufficient number of tests so that every American can have a test. I think he's got an opportunity and I would challenge him to make this a, what we, we call in the U.S., a moonshot moment, um, but to inspire the company, to the country to produce, to, to use the Defense Production Act, which is, which is something that allows us to stimulate and actually directly drive factories uh, to produce. And I think some of the reasons why we're not doing that, maybe a little bit of indecision on his part, and maybe some ideology around not wanting to interfere with business. And I think, you know, in a crisis, I hope we all drop our ideology uh, and do what's best and save the most lives possible. And, uh, and he's still not doing that, and I, and I would urge him to do that. The president seems to see the Defence Production Act as more of a, a point of leverage, a bargaining chip to try and get companies to come to the table and voluntarily do these things. How do you think another president, uh, or indeed this president, should be using them? What orders should he be giving to what companies to do what now? First of all, it's the level of production I talked about and to, to give them the loans they need to retrofit their factories to do this. I've talked to many business owners who would gladly do this what they want to be is guaranteed backstop orders, that someone will purchase these things if they produce them. And the government would never have to purchase them because someone would, would be able to purchase them. The second thing you have is a phenomenon where, you know, and I'm making this city up fictitiously, where you probably have boxes and closets and closets of medical supplies in Phoenix and uh, not enough in New York. And two months from now, you may have the need in Phoenix uh, and New York may have been past its peak point. So. Part of this is also about central coordination and making sure that we have somebody calling the shots uh, like we, you know, this is a war. I mean, this is a war against an invisible enemy and we should be running and, and reacting to it the same way we would in a war. Not, and I don't think we would run our army uh, and our Navy and our Marines uh, in, a, in anything other than a top-down command and control fashion. And I think the countries that have gotten their hands around this the fastest have been the ones that have been willing to take more severe actions. In the U.S., and I don't think Australia is much different than this, we sort of view ourselves culturally as independent, uh, not, not, not super trusting of government, and being able to have what we want when we want it. And so it's a real cultural change for someone to, to say, hey, these are some sacrifices we need to take, and we need to do them now, and if we do them, we'll be over with this more quickly. But I think that's what needs to be done, or this is going to drag on longer, and we're going to lose more lives. So, Andy, as you metaphorically or, or even literally peek through the, the, uh, the curtains to see what's going out on out there. What are the things that are concerning you most? Are there, are there issues that are perhaps not getting the attention they should right now? Well, here's the, here's the really good... I want to start with some good news. The good news is that we have, uh, even though we don't have a lot of great data, all the data we have suggests that states that have taken strict measures, like California uh, and others, where, where we are, we're putting people into what we call lockdown, which I know sounds scary, um, but, but all it really means is, you know, we've got businesses temporarily closed unless they're not essential. They've seen dramatic decreases in case counts. They've seen, and that is incredibly promising. Um, the hard part is that it's hard to sustain. And it's hard to sustain for a couple of reasons. It's hard to sustain not just because of the things the president's saying, but it's hard to sustain because we're used to taking actions that when they work, we have positive reinforcement. So we do something and we see the benefit of those results. This is quite the opposite. If you live in a community where you are staying indoors and you are not infecting other people, then what we're, what, what's happening is um, nothing. 
we're seeing we're not seeing the mad rush to the hospitals. And that causes people to wonder, gee, why am I doing this? And so it's I think it's a challenge and it's very important to remind people that by not going out and not affecting others, you're saving people's lives. Andy, I hope you don't mind me asking, but I can't help but notice that you've got a bit of a sniffle yourself. Uh, have you been tested? That's just my normal gravelly voice. I've, I've been doing probably 20 hours a day uh, just um, trying to help the administration and governors and so forth. So I feel I feel terrific. You know, in the U.S., even if I've had the sniffles, uh, uh, we need to save our tests for the frontline medical workers and first responders because we don't have sufficient tests. If indeed I were to feel uh, feverish or sick, um, I would simply isolate myself. Uh, for 14 days, unless I felt like I had difficulty breathing, in which I'd go to the hospital. So right now, that's the protocol. It shouldn't be, but given the paucity of tests in the U.S., uh, that would be the right thing to do. Fortunately, I don't. I don't. I'm not. Unfortunately, I'm feeling well. All right. Well, stay stay well, and we really appreciate you taking the time to talk to us at what is such a busy time. Andy Slavitt, good to talk to you. You too. Thank you. Just before we move on, John. Mm. I, I... I, I was thinking about how dire I was in the last section. <laughs> I was pretty dire, but it's a yeah. pretty dire situation. Sure but there is. is actually one bit of good news, and we should just note what that is. What is it? Which is that it looks like a serological test has, it has is working and could be on the market within a week. Now, when I say ser serological test, what that means is... You're saying sterological? Serological. Serological. Yeah, yeah. Got that's, it. That's a test to see, which it's a quick test that will determine whether someone either has had COVID before or right. whatever, for whatever reason is immune to COVID. Is this like what they call an antibody test? Yeah, yeah. Like, and, the, and the idea is if you can test people with the serological test, then you can determine who is safe to go back to work. Yep. And you can, and you can then do a stage by stage is this recovery. Is like a pinprick test? Yes, yes, oh. yeah, yeah. And it's, and it's so quick, very easy, easy and cheap. Very easy, very quick, very cheap. Yep. And, and you can safely refill the workforce bit by bit because if the virus is moving through people at a, at, at a rate of knots, then that means there's that many more people who will be safe to go back to work, hopefully, yes. fingers crossed, two weeks after that. Yep. And so while I don't think it's going to happen for Easter, it might happen soon after Easter. It might happen by May, say, or by, by the middle of May, maybe at worst, June that you might get substantial numbers of people back to back to work and get the economy back happening again. So yeah. it's not it's not necessarily if they play it smart, it's not necessarily a disaster. Which is time. exactly why a lot of Republicans right now are saying this two trillion dollar package, COVID three, mm. that's it. We're not gonna need more, we're not gonna have to go back to that well. That should get us through this. Mm. But that is contingent on this only taking yeah. about three months or so. Yeah. Now, this week, a lot of viewers have been asking on social media about President Trump's approval rating having gone up. And he is up to 49% in the Gallup poll this week. That is equal to the highest point of his presidency. And that was up five points in two weeks. And that led a lot of people to say, well, this is reflecting very well on his handling of coronavirus. But it's important to note a couple of things. That number in early March was that he was down at 44. That that was down from 49% a month ago, and it was at 49% in January as well. So it's hard to know if there is a corona effect going on here or whether this is just a combination of factors. Start of a re-election year. He's already spent half a billion dollars on online advertising. There's been the... He survived the impeachment yeah. process as well. Uh, it's also worth noting that while no historical historical event is directly comparable, it is interesting to look at how other major crises and disasters have impacted on presidential approval ratings. Back uh, in uh, 2012, Hurricane Sandy hit the eastern coast of the United States uh, in October of that year, just about a week or so before President Obama was up for re-election over Mitt Romney. Now, Superstorm or Hurricane Sandy caused widespread devastation. Remember the big storm surge that went through New York and Staten Island, it, you know, flooded the subway. And it was second only at the time to Hurricane Katrina. It was the most expensive storm ever to hit the United States. Well, Obama's approval rating was five points higher a month after Sandy hit than a month before Sandy hit. But, of course, that's happening straddling an election, so there are random elements in there as well. If we go back to early August 2001, a month before the 9-11 attacks, George W. Bush's approval rating, healthy, 57%. A month after the attacks, though, after Bush had had his bullhorn moment at ground zero, he was at 89%. 
A month before the bombing of the Oklahoma City Federal Building by terrorists in April 1995, Bill Clinton's approval rating was 46%. A month after what was a pretty sort of heartfelt, compassionate handling of that attack, he was up to just 51%. Unlike one-off events like a storm or a terrorist attack, the coronavirus outbreak, of course, is more of a sort of a rolling disaster, hard to pinpoint particular moments in time and measure it over presidential approval. But right now, President Trump is up around five points from that low mark, but where he was a month or so ago. So you could argue, has he got that five-point bounce that Obama and, and Clinton got? He certainly hasn't got a Bush-like 9-11 no. bounce. But he does remain uh, as the only president who has never hit higher than 49%. He's never been at 50% and he's the only president never to do that. Uh, so we'll just have to wait and see in a month or so from now, Chaz, as to is he going to break through 49 50% or are these... Uh, you know, happy talk promises of being back at work by Easter are uh, going to come back and, and bite him and people's confidence in his handling of it. But right now, he is getting pretty good marks. Yeah, yeah. For, for what it's worth, that same Gallup poll, the 49% poll, had him receiving 60% approval for his handling of the crisis. So yeah. now, there's a long way to go. We'll see where that goes. But, uh, but yeah, but at least so far, he's doing okay. I should say as well, I agree completely about with what you're saying about how many factors might be at play here. We just don't know. Well, we need, really need to look at polls for a couple of months to have a good idea yeah. of what's happening. There is a, a factor which might have something to do with this, and that is people are glued to their TVs about this COVID thing. I mean, we're benefiting from it as sure. well. People are watching our show. Right. <laughs> so, as good as that. But he's got these briefings every single day, and they are absolutely rating their socks off. <laughs> They are running an average audience of 8.5 million people on cable news alone, and they're also on network news and the internet. We're talking about the same viewership of the, as the season finale, The Bachelor, there, just for cable news. On Monday, nearly 12.2 million people watched Trump's briefing on just cable news again. That's like Monday night football numbers. Yeah. And that's more than almost, I think, every, every debate but one for the Democrats. So they are huge numbers every single day while he's holding court, yeah. looking like he's in control. So it, it helps. I'd say among those eight or so million, there are quite a few million hate watchers <laughs> or people <laughs> yes, that are just are. Wait, waiting to see if somebody like Anthony Fauci or uh, you know Barbara Dirks or somebody is going to say something mm. uh, that uh, is going to be useful to them in knowing what's going to happen tomorrow. Yeah, but we, we, as you say, we should stay tuned because these numbers can change. Yeah, they sure can. Either way. All right. Well, that is all the time we have for this fireside chat tonight. We will be back with another edition of Planet America on Wednesday night at the all-new earlier time, 9.30pm on ABC TV. We're going prime How time. How about that? Ish. And, of course, as for all the things we didn't talk about, but that, which wasn't much, we talked about a lot. Yeah. There is our podcast as well on, uh, just go to the Facebook page right there with all the details. You can see. All right. Bye-bye.